Thanks to the interstate highway system, it is now possible to travel across the country from coast to coast without seeing anything. Charles Kuralt. Chapter 22. Interstate. 22.1. Limited Access. To break the monopoly of the dominant Pennsylvania Railroad, the Vanderbilts, who owned what became the New York Central Railroad, initiated the South Pennsylvania Railroad from Harrisburg to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The New York Central already faced competition from the Erie and related railroads. Construction began on tunnels in 1884 and continued through 1885. However, while competition may be good for consumers, it is anathema to capitalists. Financier J.P. Morgan won a seat on the New York City and Hudson River Railroad and gained sufficient control to force the Vanderbilts to sell the unfinished line to the Pennsylvania Railroad. Although $10 million was spent and 26 workers died, Vanderbilt's folly remained dormant for 50 years. In 1935, the Pennsylvania legislature authored a feasibility study of building a new toll highway using the old, unutilized South Pennsylvania Railroad right-of-way and tunnels. Construction started in 1937, and the toll road opened in 1940. This was the first significant new turnpike for over 40 years, as the old turnpikes had been reverted to free roads in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Moreover, it was the first of a new generation of limited-access highways, generally called superhighways, that came to transform the American landscape. The Pennsylvania Turnpike was a forerunner of a major turnpike boom lasting from 1940 to 1956, following earlier booms in the early 19th century described in Section 3.8. During this period, in counting projects initiated in this period, some 6,400 kilometers of freeway-class turnpikes were built in the United States. In 1956, the Interstate Highway Program was funded, giving states 90% of the money toward construction of freeways, provided they were free or untold. While turnpikes are a great way to collect revenue from non-residents who may not pay a state's gas tax, an even better way is to get federal cost sharing of this magnitude. Thus, the era ended shortly after it started. The now mature urban vehicle highway system is large and intertwined in most facets of American life. Yet the vehicle highway system is almost never treated as a system. People talk about highway policy, automobile policy, safety policy, congestion policy, truck weight policy, and so forth. Historically, public policy has been directed to the provision of highways, although Interstate Commerce Commission regulation was extended to interstate truck operations during the 1930s, at the same time the states began to regulate interstate trucking. Beginning in the 1960s, and in response to Ralph Nader's 1972 Unsafe at Any Speed, U.S. federal safety policy has been significantly extended. We address the interstate in this chapter. Though the formative experiences are similar and result from the same laws, urban and intercity systems serve very different purposes and have very different problems. We profile Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs, two icons of the highway and anti-highway movements, respectively. We discuss the formation of the interstate system and examine several cases. However, by the end of the 20th century, when the interstate era ended, local governments again viewed toll roads as a reasonable way to finance roads. New toll road projects were begun in a number of cities, largely as suburb-to-suburb connections, though some suburb-to-city routes as well. Twenty two point two Inventing the Interstate Things have never been more like they are today in history. Dwight David Eisenhower twenty two point two point one Success has many fathers. The initiation of the interstate highway system followed a long period of gestation. Some interstate ideas can be traced to the 1920s. Limited access designs, interchange designs, and regional highway proposals of that time. In particular, in response to the logistics problems of World War I, the Pershing map of the 1920s proposed an extensive system of federal roads. Others, like conservationist Benton McKay, founder of the Appalachian Trail, advocated townless highways, saying, the motor slum in the open country is today as massive a piece of defilement as the worst of the old-fashioned urban industrial slums. Edward Bassett, appointed president of the National Conference on City Planning by Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover, coined the term freeway to denote a road exclusively for movement and no land access. In contrast to parkways, which were for recreation, not movement, and highways, which were for movement but allowed land access. The form of the interstate began to be developed in the 1920s. In 1924, the first National Conference on Street and Highway Safety, chaired by Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover, advocated that communities construct bypass highways and belt highways which will permit through traffic 
especially trucks, to avoid congested districts or even any built-up portions of the city or town. Bypasses created new points of great accessibility where business oriented to the automobile traveler could prosper. Inns were replaced by motels, sit-down restaurants by fast food, and gas stations just exploded across the landscape to serve the needs of the traveler. The Bureau of Public Roads' general location of the national system of interstate highways was one result of the 15-year period of planning. There were three approaches to urban links. First, small urban places were bypassed. Second, medium-sized urban places were served by a connecting link. And third, larger places where links often connected were served by circumferential routes as well as routes that entered the city. The Bureau went to considerable effort to review local plans and it had in mind the coordination of the urban links of the interstate with local plans. Bureau road programs faced problems during the Great Depression. There was the argument that the Bureau work was not labor-intensive, it didn't respond to the need for jobs. The argument that the purchase of things such as cement and road-building equipment created jobs was too complex for the political scene. Road money began to flow to the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, and that administration began to supply funds for wages to urban public works departments. In response, rural roads programs' interest began to press for Bureau-constructed toll roads. In turn, the Bureau issued its Toll Roads and Free Roads, a feasibility study of a 22,500-kilometer, 14,000-mile national toll road system, three north-south and two east-west roads. The study said that tolls would pay only 40% of costs and the toll proposal died. As an alternative, the Bureau proposed a 43,500-kilometer, or 27,000-mile, free system to be built to toll road standards. Bureau Chief McDonald disliked the toll road concept, for it was contrary to the institutional ethic of the Bureau, free roads for all. He was also concerned about the likely dysfunction of toll road institutions, self-perpetuating monopolies, nepotism, graft, and so on. There is every indication that the Bureau did not want the toll road study to find feasibility. Examining that study, one finds that traffic growth projections were modest and tolls were projected to dampen traffic growth greatly. Also, the proposals were expensive, and over-designed, certainly more than what was needed at the time for much of the mileage. Interestingly, the proposed designs were one lasting impact of the toll road study. Aspects of those designs were eventually incorporated in the interstate highway system. Returning to interstate proposals, the Bureau proposed that the system be built as a free road system. The White House asked for greater emphasis on rural roads, the proposal made for a rather thin net, two east-west routes and three north-south, as mentioned. A revised proposal was prepared in 1936. In 1941, an Interregional Highway Committee was formed, and its 1941 report, Interregional Highways, recommending a 71,000-kilometer or 44,000-mile system built to toll road standards, was enacted into law that same year. The 1956 Act, 15 years later, implemented the system. During that 15-year period, a fair amount of work was done on route locations, the famed Yellow Book, designs, and so on. Advocacy on behalf of the interstate in the 1951-1954 period was undertaken by the National Highways Users Conference, a coalition of industrials from the trucking, oil, manufacturing, auto, and farm industries, under the banner Project Adequate Roads, or PAR. Lack of quick success in the form of a weak 1952 Federal Aid Highway Act led to the breakup of the coalition. Funding was an issue, perhaps the largest, as there was general consensus on the need for an interstate highway system on the part of most parties. To help move things forward politically, President Eisenhower asked the governors for their input. The governors wanted the federal government out of the road-building business and out of the gas tax collecting business, since half the gas tax went to the federal treasury. They needed to be persuaded otherwise. A new wave of turnpikes was being constructed, the Pennsylvania Turnpike before World War II, and other turnpikes in the late 1940s and early 1950s, and this was viewed as a viable alternative to general revenue funding by many. To establish his case, Eisenhower also established two committees. The Interagency Committee, within the federal government, was chaired by Commissioner of Bureau of Public Roads, Francis DuPont. The President's Advisory Committee on a National Highway Program comprised industry leaders and was led by the chairman of the Continental Can Company, General Lucius D. Clay, a well-connected friend of Eisenhower and well-regarded logistician from the Army Corps, who most recently helped feed blockaded Berlin. Frank Turner of the BPR was executive secretary of the Clay Committee. The Clay Committee supported gas taxes to repay bonds issued by a federal highway corporation. Congress had difficulties with this, and the Clay Commission proposal would fail in 1955. 
after receiving major opposition from truckers, among others, against the gas tax, they had to be persuaded to come around as well. An interesting proposal made off and on involved taking excess property for right-of-way and selling it to finance the system as the system was developed and benefits emerged. The final financing decision was to use the federal fuel tax and to match state funds on a 90-10% basis. In 1956, the main financing question was appropriate allocation of costs to vehicles of varying size and weight, although discussion of a benefit-based financing continued for several years. There are many fathers of successful inventions. The interstate is no exception. Senator Albert Gore Sr. from Tennessee was the Senate proponent of the 1956 Federal Highway Aid Act and the Highway Revenue Act. These acts authorized $31.5 billion in federal aid and state aid to build the interstate highway system. There was much debate as to whether the road should be free or toll, dating from the 1930s. Gore fought against the plans to finance highways with bonds to be repaid with tolls and was able to get enacted pay-as-you-go taxes on fuel, tires, and trucks. This free system clearly lowered transaction costs in collecting revenue and increased use of the system compared with the toll alternative. However, it made management of the system more difficult as variable pricing by time of day and by facility is impossible with only gas taxes, resulting in the overconsumption of urban and suburban roads and congestion that confront commuters daily. The political trick to ensure the gas tax revenue would be dedicated to roads was the establishment of the Highway Trust Fund, which was solely dedicated to the interstate until 1973, at which time some funds were allowed to be spent on public transport projects in cities that canceled interstate projects. The amount was expanded in the 1980s and less restricted. In the 1990s, some of the trust fund was used for deficit reduction. That money was paid back in the 2000s when the trust fund moved from surplus to deficit, and highways again needed to borrow from general revenue because of lack of political will to either reduce spending or increase revenue. Many attribute the interstate system to President Dwight Eisenhower, for whom it has since been named. As an army colonel, Eisenhower made a famous cross-country journey in 1919 between Washington, D.C. and San Francisco on the Motor Transport Corps convoy, which took two months. The road trip in that era was very much an adventure, and while roads improved in the following 36 years with the construction of the U.S. highway system, the German Autobahn was another inspiration for the U.S. interstate program. Eisenhower, among others, observed the relative efficiency with which Germans could move forces back and forth in a two-front war during World War II. The credit Eisenhower was granted surely exceeds the credit he deserved for the system, as it was designed before he was president, and his desire for a self-liquidating, by which he meant toll-financed, system was not to be, some argued at the time, was not financially viable. The term self-liquidating was later interpreted to allow hypothecated gas taxes. 22.2.2 Regard for the Bureau of Public Roads Alice Armstrong, commissioner of the U.S. Bureau of Public Roads from 1958 to 1961, told a story to Bill Garrison some years ago, one of many that Garrison has heard illustrating the independence and professionalism of bureau leaders. After receiving letters and phone calls from then-Senator John F. Kennedy, Armstrong agreed to meet with politicians and business leaders who argued for a shift in the location of the interstate south of Boston. Leaving the meeting and greeted by Boston t reporters and TV cameras and asked for his comments, Armstrong remarked, roughly, I've received lots of interesting information, but I have to take it back to Washington for study. The interstate is a carefully planned and balanced system. Moving a link 10 miles to the south here means we will have to consider moving the entire system 10 miles to the south. Concerned that his attempt to be humorous might backfire, Armstrong was relieved that when the story played on local television, no one questioned his remarks, nor did Senator Kennedy. That, it seems, is a comment on the confidence and authority that Bureau professionals had gained through the years of service. Perhaps it also says that some citizens recognize that non-local concerns mattered. 22.2.3. The Bragdon Committee A review of the work of the Post-Interstate Act Bragdon Committee, actually General Bragdon and staff, will assist in summarizing the late 1950s mood. The treatment of the work of that committee is based on discussions with Ellis Armstrong at about the same time as the events described. Lee Mertz, one time head of planning at the Federal Highway Administration, and Paul Sitton, in the Bureau of the Budget at the time. President Eisenhower depended on staff work very heavily, as many administrators must. He supported the Interstate Act of 1956 as a measure to counter unemployment, and his assistant for public works planning, General J.S. Bragdon, began to give the interstate his attention. The 1956 Act had authorized the expenditure of $27.5 over 13 years for the construction of the interstate. 
Bragdon was shocked in 1958 when the interstate cost estimate, ICE, the cost to complete, came in at $39.9 billion, and the end date slipped into the 1980s. There was controversy when Congress raised the gas tax by a penny after the initial three-cent gas tax to pay for the interstate. The House of Representatives was concerned about the states wasting money, and Congressman Blatnick was named chair of the House Special Subcommittee on the Federal Aid Highway Program. Bragdon, working with the Bureau of the Budget, took it as his task to correct the situation and worked for a couple of years to get the estimate under control and trimmed down. Working with a staff of about 25, Bragdon made analyses and made suggestions to the Bureau of Public Roads, through the Department of Commerce where it was then housed. A dozen or so memos record Bragdon's recommendations and the BPR's reactions. Bragdon was very concerned about the money required for the program. He suggested expenditure reductions, and the BPR typically countered these by reference to the act and congressional intent. Bragdon suggested that the states that wanted to accelerate programs build toll roads. They could use the money from these tolls to accelerate the provision of untold facilities. The net effect would be to speed up construction. Though he was interested in toll roads, Bragdon's main thrust was reduction of expenditures in urban areas. His argument was that Congress hadn't intended to manage urban problems. He made many proposals suggesting limiting the system, in particular the number of lanes in urban areas, capacity for rush hour traffic, number of interchanges, and number of spurs into the cities, relying on outer loops only. All of this was to keep the cost down. He argued that the Secretary of Commerce had the power to take routes off the interstate and should take some urban routes off. Bragdon didn't understand the progressive cooperative traditions of the Bureau. Many of his suggestions were unthinkable in that context. A point of difficulty for Bragdon was the lack of information on where roads were needed in the urban areas. The Bureau of Public Roads and ASHO, the American Association of State Highway Officials, had been working with the American Municipal Association and had plans for 149 of the 288 cities of over 25,000 in population, and 45 more were on the way. Bragdon did not think that was proper. The BPR was responding to what the cities wanted. He demanded that the planning be required by the BPR. While it was to be comprehensive, it was to be in the frame of strict policy on state-local arrangements, that is, Bragdon's ideas of how urban extension should be allocated. Plans, as Bragdon imagined them, couldn't be completed in two months. As remarked, the Bureau was working with the ASHO and the American Municipal Association in a cooperative style. It had arranged the first national conference on highways and urban development at Sagamore Syracuse University in New York in 1958, which addressed design planning issues. Returning to Bragdon's demand that planning be mandated, the BPR countered that it did not have the power to require planning. That remark may seem strange from the perspective of today, for the federal government now requires significant planning efforts from local and state governments. The issue is a constitutional one. The Constitution allows Congress to tax to provide for the common defense and the general welfare of the United States. But there is another clause that the states have all the powers not specifically reserved for the federal government. The debate over the meaning of the welfare clause began with Hamilton and Madison, and there is a parallel long trail of court cases. In the early days of the Bureau's programs, funding was allocated according to post-road mileage, where providing for the mail was one of the powers of the federal government. Later, no questions were raised about matching money for federal aid system. An additional question to be settled was whether the federal government could withhold tax monies it has collected to get the states to do something. That was the leverage the Bureau would have to use to get planning started. Either plan, or no federal money will be available. The power of the federal government to withhold funds was not settled by court cases until the 1970s, and it was that unsettled question that had made the Bureau go slow in requiring planning. There was a showdown meeting between Bragdon, the BPR, and Eisenhower in 1960. It is recorded that Eisenhower said that running the interstate through congested cities was not his concept and wish. However, the BPR pointed out that the Yellow Book, formerly the general location of national system of interstate highways including all additional routes at urban areas, was in the hands of Congress, and it was responsible for the 90-10 formula, 90% federal funding, 10% state, rather than 60-40 as first proposed. Because Congress knew of the urban extensions, the program was committed to them. We are interested in Bragdon's work because it represents some of the thinking of the times. There was the fear that urban expenditures formed a monetary black hole. Was urban congestion a federal government problem? The interstate cost estimate kept going up and increases in taxes or program stretch out were not popular. In the early 1950s, there had been considerable questioning of whether a federal program was needed. Our view is that the thinking of the times resulted in the urban interstate being built 
on the cheap, or at least contributed to it. The center lane mileage of Lynx was limited, capacity was increased by adding lanes. A lower level of service was accepted in urban areas compared with rural areas. Cheapness producing congestion created by channeling traffic onto a limited mileage facility is our main point. There was little or no debate about improved arterial, parkway, limited truckways, or other alternative designs. In spite of the multiple lanes constructed to serve estimated traffic for 20 years, interstate links were soon congested. How did we get into this mess? Schwartz, 1976, says, If there was a moving party heavy for the urban interstates, it was the cities themselves rather than the highway lobby. He points out that city planners were generally in favor and that politicians looked to free money from the federal government. Alf Johnson of Asho and some of the BPR managers that Garrison knew cooled on involvement in urban areas as the many problems became apparent. Twenty two point three freeways rising twenty two point three point one freeways in Japan. The growth pattern in the United States and Europe was replicated and accelerated in subsequent national motorizations. After World War II, the use of the automobile in Japan took off, as seen in the figure. The number of vehicles rose from about 142,000 in 1945 to 922,000 in 1955. As late as 1955, the main road between Tokyo and Osaka was unpaved for one-third of its length. See the figure. The first expressways weren't open until the Meishin Expressway in 1963. Clearly, the vehicles drove the demand for expressways, which can be seen to be lagging vehicle growth significantly. 22.3.2 Building Urban Highways, the case of I-94 Aside from the urban freeway revolts discussed in section 22.3.3, the construction of the interstate proceeded about as well as can be expected in most cities. Although over budget and late, it was eventually built. One such case is I-94 between Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. Between 1947 and 1950, vehicle registrations in the Twin Cities increased 58%. St. Paul officials realized that they needed to solve congestion and other transportation problems. Previously, city officials dealt with increased congestion by widening existing links. This option was becoming increasingly expensive as the city grew. Freeway plans were developed connecting downtown Minneapolis and downtown St. Paul, but it wasn't until the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 was implemented that it became certain a freeway would be constructed. The Federal Aid Highway Act ensured there would be funds available, 90% federal to be matched by 10% state. With the construction of some freeway insured, the next step was to determine which route it should follow. St. Paul and state officials recommend that the route follow St. Anthony Avenue, a largely residential street parallel to the busiest route between the two cities, University Avenue, which happened to run through a minority neighborhood, the Rondo. George Harold, St. Paul's chief planning engineer until 1952, argued against the construction of a freeway along this route. He proposed a plan dubbed the Northern Route, about a mile to the north of the St. Anthony Route. The Northern Route, because of its use of existing railroad right-of-way and industrial land, would not displace many residents or sever neighborhoods. In St. Paul, the St. Anthony Route divided the state capital and government buildings from the Central Business District. Despite Harold's advice, St. Paul and state officials would not deviate from the proposed St. Anthony Route. With the St. Anthony Route all but built, concerned residents began to speak out. The St. Anthony Route would displace nearly one in seven of St. Paul's African-American residents. African-American community leaders quickly concluded that it would be nearly impossible to divert the freeway, so they devised a list of actions they requested government officials to comply with. Help displaced residents find adequate housing, provide proper compensation, construct a depressed or below-grade freeway to enhance aesthetics. The displacement of African-American community members was especially significant because there were few options available to them. At the time, the 1950s, before fair housing laws were enacted, most white communities would neither sell nor rent homes to them. For this reason, officials feared that the African-American community would become overcrowded. In the end, only the second and third actions were followed, though. The Prospect Park neighborhood in Minneapolis was also severed by the St. Anthony alignment and residents were worried the freeway would turn this diverse upper-middle-class neighborhood into a low-income one. Residents claimed that having a low-class neighborhood within close proximity to the University of Minnesota would make the university unappealing to students and faculty. The community had one request, that the freeway be placed over an existing railroad spur. However, limited funding disallowed this idea. The freeway did, however, skirt the Malcolm E. Wiley House designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Despite the freeway separating the neighborhood from the Mississippi River, the neighborhood did not deteriorate. 
The freeway was completed in the late 1960s. Aesthetically, the I-94 freeway is a scar across the surface of the city. In addition to having displaced residents at disconnected local streets, moves traffic from a relatively even distribution to a more hierarchical one, so that movement depends on fewer, now more critical, links. While certainly more people are moving longer distances every day on the urban freeway, congestion has far from disappeared. One can ask in retrospect whether building the road was the right thing, or whether building it there was the right thing, but there is no real control for this experiment. Asking what ifs are easy, answering them is harder. But no one is seriously calling for the removal of this element of the interstate system, suggesting the collective intuition of those who think about the road daily suggests that sunk costs are sunk, and while in retrospect not everything was done perfectly, leaving it in place is better than removing it. 23.3.3 Freeway Revolts People of Earth, your attention please. This is Prostenic Vogon Jeltz of the Galactic Hyperspace Planning Council. As you will no doubt be aware, the plans for development of the outlying regions of the galaxy require the building of a hyperspatial express route through your star system, and regrettably, your planet is one of those scheduled for demolition. The process will take slightly less than two of your Earth minutes. Thank you. There's no point in acting all surprised about it. All the planning charts and demolition orders have been on display in your local planning department in Alpha Centauri for 50 of your Earth years, so you've had plenty of time to lodge any formal complaint and it's far too late to start making a fuss about it now. Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy On November 2, 1956, the San Francisco Chronicle published a map of the proposed freeways through San Francisco while its editorial page was noting about the emerging revolt. A remarkable aspect of these protests and claims of injury is their tardiness. They concern projects that have been for years set forth in master plan surveys and expensive traffic studies. They have been ignored or overlooked by citizens and public officials alike until the time was at hand for concrete pouring, and when revision had become either impossible or extremely costly. The evidence indicates that the citizenry never did know or had forgotten what freeways the planners had in mind for them. The newspaper was referring to protests, including a petition signed by more than 30,000 residents of affected neighborhoods. On January 23, 1959, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors voted to remove seven of the ten planned freeways from the city master plan. The Embarcadero Freeway, which had already been constructed from Folsom Street to Broadway, was halted mid-ramp and left to sit there for another 30 years until the Loma Prieta earthquake prompted the city to pull down the remainder and reopen the waterfront. The freeway revolt that sparked the Board of Supervisors' move was a bitter fight between citizen activists and the professionals. It was a revolt that was to be replayed in many other U.S. cities over the next three decades, with different outcomes depending on the city. Section 22.3.5 discusses the revolt in New York. The revolt in San Francisco played in many newspapers and was emulated in many cities. It is often taken as an anti-urban interstate revolt, but as the western terminus of Interstate 80, the interstate mileage was minimal. The freeways were to be state and city planned and funded. The plan, first developed in 1947, was only partially completed. 22.3.4 Profile Robert Moses. Robert Moses, 1888 to 1981, was born in New Haven, Connecticut, the son of a department store owner and grandson of a New York merchant. He studied at Yale and Oxford and received a PhD in political science from Columbia University in 1914. His first job was with the Bureau of Municipal Research, a data crunching organization in New York that let him work on city budget issues. After World War I, he led New York's Committee on Retrenchment and Reorganization and thus aligned himself with Alfred E. Smith in the good government movement that emerged during the 1920s. He rose through the political ranks and in 1927 was appointed New York's Secretary of State. Though he had tangles with Smith's successor as governor, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Moses was able to leverage the power accumulated while under Smith to keep him in a dominant position in New York infrastructure for the next 35 years. In 1922, Moses drew up the New York State Park Plan, which included the ability to issue bonds to rehabilitate parks and to build parkways, and more important, highways leading to the parks. In 1924, Moses became chairman of the State Council of Parks and also was president of the Long Island State Park Commission. His parks, especially on Long Island, were very successful, and New Yorkers clamored to reach them. In 1930, Moses extended the parkways into the city. These parkways were 90 to 180 meters, 300 to 600 feet wide, gracefully curving with no traffic lights and low overpasses, thereby prohibiting both trucks and buses from using them. Roadside commerce was also prohibited, aside from special rest stops. 
His success with the parks and parkways led the new governor, Herbert Lehman, to make him chairman of the Emergency Public Works Commission in 1933. This commission promoted new river crossings over the Hudson and East Rivers in New York, which would be toll bridges, which would require toll authorities, which naturally would be run by Moses. These authorities were self-sustaining and self-liquidating organizations, supported by user fees, which could issue bonds repaid by future revenue. They were new publicly authorized monopolies without elected leadership. In 1933, Mayor LaGuardia asked Moses to serve in his city cabinet. Moses agreed, provided he could retain his other positions. Unlike present-day politicians, Moses was able to hold state and city positions simultaneously, allowing his empire to grow. This was permitted largely because he did not draw salary from most of his positions. Aside from an independent revenue stream and the control of multiple agencies at city and state level, Moses' tools included having his plans ready and fully designed before the money became available, thus allowing him to deliver projects quickly. Today, projects have to go through lengthy design and environmental approvals before they can be started, so even if cash were available, it would be years before the ribbon cutting. Somewhat more deviously, Moses tended to underestimate the costs of projects so that they would be started and cost and quality desired would escalate. He offered the sponsoring politicians two choices. Provide more money, or he would stop construction. The politician would have to explain why he wasted all that money building a half-finished useless project. Though this happened repeatedly, politicians were always willing to swallow the promise of the low cost because Moses had the reputation of delivering the ribbon cutting before the next election. It would take far too long to list all of Moses' achievements here. Robert Cairo, in 1974, wrote a 1,344-page book, The Power Broker, describing and decrying what Moses did to the city. But whether he was loved or hated, he radically reshaped New York into a modern city using park and road building as his tools. 22.3.5 Profile Jane Jacobs Jane Jacobs, 1916-2006, to was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, the daughter of a doctor who moved to New York at the age of 12. Like Moses, she attended Columbia University. She then entered the publishing industry as an editor and writer for magazines such as Architectural Forum and Fortune. A student of the city, she published several books, including Death and Life of the Great American Cities, 1961. In that first book, she celebrated the rich, textured chaos of urban streets, like her neighborhood in Greenwich Village, which had shopkeepers and other citizens monitoring the public spaces eyes on the street. She railed against urban renewal and freeway building, such as Moses' Cross Bronx Expressway, that gutted organically arising places, vital centers of your urban life, and replaced them with artificial, inhumane spaces. In 1962, she became chair of the Joint Committee to Stop the Lower Manhattan Expressway, sponsored by the Downtown Lower Manhattan Association, led by David Rockefeller. The Lower Manhattan Expressway was proposed by the highway builders, including Moses, and incorporated into the interstate highway plan to provide, as the name suggests, a new eight-lane limited-access roadway from the west side of Manhattan, the Holland Tunnel, to the east, the Manhattan and Williamsburg Bridges. It had a sister project, the Upper Manhattan Expressway, and another sister, the Mid-Manhattan Elevated Expressway. The road would have bisected neighborhoods such as Greenwich Village, Little Italy, Chinatown, and Soho, displacing thousands of residents, merchants, artists, and artisans. In December 1962, the highway was canceled and Moses was defeated by a woman he had called a busy housewife. In April 1968, she was arrested in another protest against the highway. In transportation infrastructure, no rarely means no. The collective protests ultimately led to the highway being canceled. Twenty two point four The Interstate at Maturity. twenty two point four point one Rebuilding Urban Highways The Case of the Big Dig. Wouldn't it be cheaper to raise the city than to depress the artery? Barney Frank. Perhaps the last major construction project on the US urban freeway system is the Big Dig, Boston's relocation of its urban freeways from an elevated highway to an underground. The story of the Big Dig began with the pre-interstate construction of the Central Artery, an elevated highway through downtown Boston that was funded by the state. Like other highways constructed in the United States in the 1950s, the highway reduced traffic congestion in Boston for a while, but by the mid-1960s, Boston's highways and local roads were again heavily congested. Highway planners proposed a ring road around the downtown Central Business District as a solution to the congestion, and a third tunnel was proposed in 1968 for construction between downtown Boston to near Logan Airport. The question of whether additional roads should be built 
raged in Boston during the late 1960s and early 1970s. Two projects survived, a restricted-use tunnel from downtown Boston to Logan Airport and reconstruction of the central artery that would relocate the highway underground, eliminating the division between downtown and the North End and waterfront neighborhoods, which had been determined to be a detriment to the city by this time. Over the next 20 years, the Central Artery Tunnel Project evolved through complex negotiations into what is being constructed today, the most expensive urban highway project ever undertaken in the United States. The project was only made possible because in the early 1980s, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Thomas P. Tip O'Neill, served the Boston area and, on retiring, was able to get the highway as a present from Congress and then-President Ronald Reagan. Nearly every component of this project underwent numerous modifications to address concerns of special interest groups, modification that often resulted in raising the concerns of other special interest groups. Mitigation costs mounted. Ultimately, it is expected that most of the project's more than $14 billion cost is due to mitigation. The engineering challenges of constructing a tunnel underneath a highway while keeping that highway operating should not be underestimated. The Big Dig is an exception to highway planning in the last quarter of the 20th century. The Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 restricted highway development and air pollution non-attainment areas and promoted actions to restrict vehicle uses. The Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act of 1991 reformulated funding to allow for a level playing field between transit and highways, allowed for direct relations between the feds and councils of government in large urban areas, authorized increased funding for transit, and also authorized a national highway system. Legislation in 1995 implemented the national highway system. The Transportation Equity Act for the 21st Century, T21, basically followed the formula of ICE-T. According to conversations with project champion Fred Salvucci, no consideration was given to just tearing down the artery and not replacing it, as has been done with many urban freeways since. 22.4.2 Building Suburban Highways, Intercounty Connector In 1950, the National Capital Planning Commission proposed an outer circumferential freeway, outer beltway, for the Washington, D.C. area. This beltway was to fall beyond the radius of what later became the Capitol Beltway, I-495, I-95. The Capitol Beltway has been called Washington's Main Street. Would the Outer Beltway be similarly profound? Importantly, the Outer Beltway was placed on land use maps so that residents would know where the right-of-way of this route was to be. Local governments began to acquire the land in the right-of-way of the road so that it would be preserved. However, some parts of the Outer Beltway appeared incompatible with local land use plans, in particular building new roads through an area designated as rural. Further, Virginia residents in the wealthy district of Great Falls opposed the interstate highway in their neighborhood, where the bridge would land. Thus, in 1968, the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, a bi-county agency serving the Maryland suburbs and distinct from the National Capital Planning Commission, took sections of the Outer Beltway connecting what became I-270 with Virginia, which would better connect to Dulles Airport, see section 22.4.4, controlled by the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority, an agency controlled by Virginia and Washington, D.C., off the map. Still, the sections connecting I-270 in Montgomery County, Maryland, with I-95 in nearby U.S. 1 in Prince George's County, Maryland, reducing travel times to Baltimore-Washington International Airport, controlled by the Maryland Department of Transportation, remained on the plan and were renamed the Intercounty Connector, or ICC, not to be confused with the former federal agency of the same letters. This is about a 29-kilometer, 18-mile highway, depending on the final right-of-way chosen. The Capitol Beltway was opened in 1964, and by 1979, transportation officials were beginning to seriously consider the ICC. The Maryland State Highway Administration, SHA, initiated the first of two project planning studies for the ICC. By 1983, the first draft environmental impact statement was issued, and public hearings were held. A small section of the road, I-370, connecting eastward from I-270 to the Shady Grove Metro Station, was constructed. However, budget and environmental issues kept most of the road as proposed. The original alignment and later southwestern spur of the ICC, connecting to I-270 south in the city of Rockville, dubbed the Rockville Facility, would cross Rock Creek Park in the northwest branch. The planning agency and state government had acquired much of the land in this master plan alignment to preserve the right-of-way. Government ownership of land does have its drawbacks, and in 1987, Maryland State Senator Ida Mae Garrett was able to pass a state law creating Matthew Henson State Park in part of the road right-of-way and prohibiting the state from building the highway. The county has constructed part of the western segment of the road, now the Montrose Parkway, in a suburban area without significant environmental impacts. Another study took place in the 1990s, and in 1997, 
the State Highway Administration issued a second draft environmental impact statement. But the road remained controversial. Residents were mixed. Some sought the road to relieve congestion. Others opposed the road for its environmental impacts, in particular its crossing near the headwaters of otherwise protected stream valleys. The road runs east-west. Most streams in Montgomery County run north-south. Proponents claimed the ICC is not about promoting tomorrow's growth. It's about providing for yesterday's growth. The Army Corps of Engineers, which regulates wetlands, was a major player in the EIS and proposed a number of new alignments for consideration not in the master plan right-of-way. Their objective was to protect the streams and the spawning grounds of German brown trout, which were introduced at the beginning of the 20th century and now reproduced naturally. The additional rights-of-way greatly increased opposition, as now more people would be affected by a possible road than previously. Moreover, people bought lands and homes believing they would not be affected by the road because of Montgomery County's long-standing practice of building roads at the place they were on the plan. In 1999, Maryland Governor Paris Glendening halted the ICC planning study and canceled the middle section of the road while keeping the eastern and western portions on the map. I will not build the intercounty connector. As far as I'm concerned, there is no ICC. His Solomonic decision did not have the effect hoped for, killing the road. Lieutenant Democratic Lieutenant Governor Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, running for governor when Glenn, when Glenn Denning's term expired, was more politic. If I had an answer, I'd give it to you. But with legal impediments to the ICC, you have to cut your losses and build all of those other roads. In 2002, Townsend lost to Republican Robert Ehrlich, a road proponent. A third draft environmental impact statement was conducted by the SHA, which, under Ehrlich, made this Maryland's highest priority new project. The federal government fast-tracked the environmental review process, lawsuits were won, to pay for the road and restrict traffic, tolls were imposed, construction contracts were let. In November 2011, the road was completely opened as Maryland 200 between I-270 and I-95. Maryland 200 is a very nice ride, perhaps one of the more pleasant roads to be on. Compared with most long-distance roads in Montgomery County, it does not yet suffer congestion, and with tolls, it may almost never. So long as the original opponents of the road remain alive, there will be grumblings about the road. But like I-94 above and all infrastructure, it will eventually become part of the landscape. As of 2012, it carried 34,000 vehicles a day in its peak section, lower than the traffic flow before the tolls were started, 44,000 vehicles a day. The fears about induced development, development that would not take place but for the road, and induced demand, trips taken or lengthened that would not take place but for the road, will eventually be realized. Transportation creates accessibility. New projects change the accessibility landscape. Developers and travel will take advantage. The road, a dashed line on the map for over 50 years, in serious consideration to move forward for over 25, is finally a solid line on the map, and on a map more complicated than previous. It took so long to build not because of a lack of information or a lack of public participation, but because of a lack of political will and paralysis by analysis. If you can't win on the facts, you propose another study. As researchers, we think studies and information are good things, but studies should not be used to justify rather than to inform. It is the decision makers who must decide. Transportation and land use interact. Foremost, transportation creates access, and by creating access, transportation embodies that land with value. Second, transportation consumes land. It does this for the linear facilities themselves, roads and rail networks, as well as the nodes, ports, airports, and parking. In urban areas, the land devoted to parking is surprising. See section 15.5. This is a cost of transportation facilities, but is paid for during construction. Third, transportation causes negative externalities for those who are adjacent to facilities, including noise, pollution, the potential for fire from steam-powered trains, and severing communities, both human and ecological, along their routes. The debate about the intercounty connector touched on all three issues and basically asked the question, does the improved access offset the negative externalities? Proponents would argue that the negative externalities from the road are offset by reduced negative externalities on other routes. Opponents would argue that the gain in relative accessibility in Montgomery County is offset by the loss in relative accessibility to places not on the route. Further, the road would encourage workers in Prince George's County to work in Montgomery County, thereby making the rich richer since Montgomery would get jobs without the cost of supporting residents. How these qualitative arguments balance quantitatively depends on where you sit. 22.4.3, the last interstate. I-69 runs from the Canadian border at Port Huron, Michigan to the I-465 beltway around Indianapolis. Advocates for freeway. Advocates for freeways led by David Graham, descendant of the founders of automaker Graham Page in southeastern Indiana, proposed extending the route in that direction. 
Recognizing there is no national interest in the small highway segment, they built a coalition for a 2,700-kilometer, 1,700-mile highway through Tennessee, Kentucky, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. The Southwestern Indiana Highway Coalition was expanded to a mid-continent highway coalition. This local road was now of national interest, perhaps as a NAFTA highway connecting Mexico with Canada, though imagines few trucks would make such a long journey, but garnering the interest of congressional delegations from eight states. Federal Highway Priority Corridors 18 and 20 designated in 1991's ICE-T became part of the proposed extension of I-69. Much of this involves upgrading of existing routes, but there is a new construction required as well, which has attracted opposition from environmental groups and local preservationists. The entire route has been divided into sections of independent utility, or SIUs, which are supposed to be constructed independently and, as the name suggests, be justifiably independent as well. Whether the route as a whole is economically justified is also debated. Opponents note that interstates can get you from Laredo to Port Huron in 2,746 kilometers, or 1,706 miles, while the proposed I-69 is 2,881 kilometers, or 1,790 miles. Laredo, one of the possible termini on the Mexican border, has interstate service. McAllen and Brownsville in Texas, other possible termini, do not. There are obviously local time savings for individual communities that would be on I-69 and are relatively far from other interstates. Whether that justifies the cost or the federalization of the highway is not clear. 22.4.4 Private Roads, the case of the Dulles Greenway, Virginia. The first private toll road in Virginia since 1816, the Dulles Greenway is a 22.5 kilometer, 14 mile, western extension of the Dulles Toll Road, connecting Washington Dulles International Airport, opened in 1963, with U.S. Route 15 in Leesburg, Virginia. The Dulles Greenway originated in 1988 with the Virginia General Assembly authorizing the private development of toll roads. Construction began in September 1993, and the road opened for service on September 29, 1995, which the owners, Toll Road Investors Partnership II, note was six months ahead of schedule and under budget. On opening, it comprised seven interchanges, 36 bridges, a toll plaza, 12 ramp toll barriers, an administration building, and four operational lanes. It further allowed for construction of two additional lanes, two additional interchanges, and for a rail system in the median. Dulles Greenway is one of the first toll highways in the United States that was designed, built, and financed in the private sector since the end of the 19th century turnpike era. Dulles Greenway is the fourth highway segment comprising the Dulles Transportation Corridor in Virginia. The others include the Dulles Airport Access Road, DAAR, was built by the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, and opened in 1962 along with the Dulles International Airport. It is a no-toll, 12-mile-long, four-lane expressway serving only airport traffic. The Dulles Toll Road, DTR, which opened in 1984, was built by the Virginia Department of Transportation and now owned by the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority. It consists of four and six lanes paralleling both sides of the DAAR. It has full interchanges and no restrictions on vehicle size or type. The Dulles Access Road Extension, a no-toll four-lane, two-mile-long expressway extending eastward from the DAAR and DTR to I-66 by Falls Church, Virginia, with both truck and occupancy restrictions, was completed in 1985. The initial toll was $1.75 each way and did not vary with the length of travel along the highway or the time of day. In comparison, the toll on the Dulles Toll Road was only 85 cents. The volume of traffic averaged 11,000 vehicles daily, much less than estimates of 25,000 vehicles per day. Suggestions for increasing patrons including lowering the toll for non-rush hours and weekends, pricing comparable for length traveled along the highway, better marketing strategies, increasing the speed limit, and establishing electronic tolling. The investors believed that the highway might have been five years ahead of itself since development was just beginning along the project. Michael Crane, one of the proprietors, when asked what he would do differently next time, stated, I would never do it as a totally private toll road. I would do it as a public-private venture. The Virginia Senate in February 1996 passed bills allowing the Dulles Greenway to have a speed limit of 65 miles per hour and to obtain federal highway loans. The toll was reduced from $1.75 to $1 in 1996 and volume doubled, but the owners missed a $7 million interest payment to its creditors and a $3.6 million payment to the state of Virginia in July of 1996. The owners were given time to refinance the $350 million debt and succeeded in April 1999. A higher speed limit of 65 miles per hour, electronic toll collection, and a frequent user program are credited with the highway having 40,000 vehicles per day in 1999. Development expanded significantly in 1999 with then-fast-growing internet companies MCI WorldCom and America Online, AOL, having offices in the corridor. 
Tolls were increased for the Dulles Greenway to $1.40 for cash and $1.15 for electronic payment. Loudoun County began analyzing large developments for the corridor. Future population projections resulted in the owners expanding the Dulles Greenway. Construction for an eastbound lane began in June 2000 and was completed in December 2000. The westbound lane began construction in the spring of 2001 and was completed in August 2001. Construction costs for the additional five miles of two lanes were estimated at $10.4 million. Usage of the Dulles Greenway increased over 60,000 vehicles per day in June of 2002, a 7% increase from a year earlier. Loudoun County has experienced rapid growth in the last few years, which significantly increased highway use. The Dulles Greenway is one of the few experiments with private building and financing of a project that had been, in the past been accomplished with public resources. The risks that private partners incurred were an extremely large leveraged debt, a long time frame before profitability, a project subject to economic downturns, and competition from untold roads. In addition, Dulles Greenway could not raise its toll above $2 unless the Virginia State Corporation Commission, the SCC, gave the owners permission. The main advantages that the Dulles Greenway Highway realized were that the lenders were willing to negotiate and wait for payments, and the highway was built in an area that was expanding. Though a bit premature, the road may yet turn out to be profitable. The Dulles Corridor itself continues to grow fast as government contractors and high-tech companies choose to locate with easy access to downtown Washington, suburban Tyson's Corner, and the airport. Tyson's Corner, Virginia, exemplifies the pattern of suburban crossroads emerging as centers are widespread. Tyson's Corner is the largest job center in metropolitan Washington, D.C., and the 12th largest business district in the United States. Tyson's Corner was at the intersection of Route 7 and Leesburg Pike, running from Alexandria, Virginia to Leesburg, county seat of Loudoun County, and Route 123, Chain Bridge Road, Dolly Madison Boulevard, running from the Chain Bridge in Washington, D.C., just north of Georgetown, to the city of Fairfax, Virginia, the county seat of Fairfax County. The value of this once rural crossroads was enhanced with the construction of the Capitol Beltway, I-495, and the Dulles Airport Road in the 1960s near the crossroads. First a shopping mall and later offices were located at Tyson's. In this case, the nucleus occurs because Alexandria and Georgetown, both part of Washington, D.C., when it was created, and before Alexandria was retroceded to Virginia, were small centers in their own rights as ports on either side of the Potomac River. Since cities are not points, routes which travel from a hinterland to one point in the city may cross another route connecting to a different hinterland point to a different point in the city. Proposals to tie the Washington Metro, discussed in Section 23.3, to the Dulles Airport via Tyson's Corner have been around since the earliest days of the airport planning, when the access road preserved in the median a right-of-way for potential rail use. Plans were proposed in the 1990s by private firms to build and operate the line. Ultimately, most of the profits of the Dulles Toll Road were dedicated to funding the new Metro Rail Silver Line. One of the major debates around the line was whether the section through Tyson's Corner should be elevated, at less cost, or tunneled, which would provide a better urban form. In the event, cost went out. Project-related construction began in 2008, with a completion date of Phase 1 in 2013 and a hope for completion date of Phase 2 to the airport in 2016. 22.4.5 High Occupancy Vehicles On December 30, 1940, just prior to the Tournament of Roses Parade, the Arroyo Seco Parkway connecting Los Angeles and Pasadena, California's first freeway opened to traffic. The road was perceived to be so successful that a full-fledged freeway network followed. The Santa Monica Freeway I-10 in Los Angeles appeared on planners' maps as early as 1956 as the Olympic Freeway, so its first segment opened to traffic in 1961. It was completed by 1966. While freeways were still widely, though not universally, lauded, transportation professionals recognized that different vehicles had different values of time, and there might be some gains to give priority to those with a higher value. To that end, high-occupancy vehicle, HOV or diamond lanes, were first deployed on the Shirley Highway, I-95, in Virginia outside of Washington, D.C. in 1969 as an exclusive bus line. Today, there are over 3,200 kilometers, 2,000 miles, of HOV lanes in the United States. By restricting traffic and ensuring free-flow speeds, HOV lanes provide an incentive for travelers to form carpools and that thus reduce the number of vehicles on both the freeway with the HOV lane as well as the roads leading to the freeway. They also reward existing carpools as well as users of buses and van pools who take advantage of the faster routes. By privileging these high-value vehicles, total social benefits are supposed to increase. Following on the success of HOV lanes, such as the Shirley Highway, and with little advance warning to motorists, in 1976, the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans, converted a lane of the Santa Monica Freeway to HOV 3+, requiring three or more persons per vehicle to use the lane. 
This provided an incentive for carpoolers. By converting a lane, Caltrans made the time difference between the HOV and other lanes greater, but thereby punished those who did not use HOV by reducing the available capacity and increasing their travel times. Evidence showed rising HOV use in transit ridership soon after. However, this takeaway strategy led to vociferous protests from motorists who felt a real loss, and within a few weeks, Caltrans relented and reverted that lane back to general purpose traffic. The lesson that was learned, and learned perhaps too well, is that takeaway strategies are unacceptable, and HOV must be the result of additional capacity. While HOV users can benefit, other users must not be harmed. The consequence is that when an HOV lane opens, bus passengers and carpools of course benefit, but those who drive alone also benefit because there are fewer carpools congesting their lanes. This greatly diminishes the potential time savings that HOV provides. HOVs only work well, better than general purpose lanes, within a small window. If the main line is uncongested or will be so after the HOV lane is added, there is no benefit. If the HOV lane itself becomes congested, there also will be diminished benefit. An example of this experiment took place on the El Monte Busway demonstration project along the San Bernardino Freeway in Los Angeles. The busway was opened in 1973, and HOV 3+, Plus were permitted to use the facility in 1975. Still, the lane had the appearance of being under its vehicle carrying capacity. In 1999, the California legislature instructed Caltrans to lower the vehicle occupancy required to use the facility. A study of this experiment found that the addition of HOV 2 plus carpoolers caused congestion in the carpool lanes, worsening reliability and increasing travel times for both cars and buses. Yet freeway travel times in the general purpose lanes did not see significant improvements. In July 2000, the road became HOV 3 plus again. The HOV lane enabled a new transportation phenomenon, dubbed the slug line in metropolitan Washington, or instant or casual carpoolers in somewhat more jargon-laden transportation talk. Slugs, or members of the slug line, are commuters who wait at known locations, typically at or near bus stops, to be picked up by single-occupant vehicles, SOVs, hoping to use the HOV lane but lacking a passenger. The phenomenon emerged as SOVs cruised bus stops looking for passengers, but soon individuals with no intention of riding the bus would queue up. The phenomenon emerged spontaneously without government organization or posting of signs. Whether this is a good or bad idea, we will leave to the reader's judgment. However, the slugs on average double the value of the cargo carried by passenger vehicles. Whether this process eliminates another vehicle on the road or a passenger on the bus depends on the slug. Slugging briefly emerged in New York City after Hurricane Sandy, and the resulting closure of many subway and conversion of streets in Manhattan to HOV 3 plus. 22.4.6 Hot Lanes and Hot Networks In the late 1990s, high occupancy toll, hot lanes that would allow single occupant vehicles to use HOV lanes after paying a toll that depends on the level of demand, began to be considered in many U.S. metropolitan areas. Hot lanes were conceived by Ward Elliott at Claremont McKenna College in the 1970s and reinvented in the 1990s by Gordon Fielding and Dan Klein as part of a Reason Foundation study. Hot lanes were introduced on I-15 in San Diego, for instance, using the same facility that had been the testbed for the automated highway systems experiment described in Chapter 30, and have generally been viewed as successful. The revenue generated after paying for operating the facility helped subsidize transit in the corridor. Seeing the success of I-15 as well as a handful of other hot lanes, Pool et al. call for networks of hot lanes or hot networks in major U.S. cities. They conclude that the benefits of such a system, including congestion reduction for those not using the system, outweigh the costs. While pricing every congested road using marginal cost pricing may increase system efficiency, providing differentiated services further enhances efficiency. We recognize that different types of freight have different priorities. Overnight, two-day, and ground are choices for shipping. That same kind of differentiation applies to drivers. Different drivers have different values of time at different times of the day. Thus, the ability to pay a premium and travel at a better level of service during peak time provides a service not currently available, service enabled by bundling several ideas. The old idea is tolls themselves, whose original intent was simply to raise revenue. Electronic toll collection complements that. Its original intent was simply to automate the collection of tolls at traditional toll booths, reducing both traveler delay and agency operating costs. HOV lanes aimed at giving priority to vehicles carrying more passengers, vehicles which had a higher value of time, since two people are more than one. The hot networks also provide the ability to provide bus rapid transit services in metropolitan areas by providing the high-speed limited access routes that give transit a travel time advantage over the automobiles, not paying for the hot lanes. In many situations, buses are more cost-effective than fixed rail alternatives, but the lack of a fast right-of-way leads people to perceive rail as inherently faster than buses. With BRT, that perception can be made to disappear. 
Several cities are now building out hot networks through a combination of new construction and conversion of HOV lanes. Twenty two point six freight. There was Anthony Stracci who controlled the New Jersey area and the shipping on the west side docks of Manhattan. He ran the gambling in Jersey and was very strong with the Democratic political machine. He had a fleet of freight hauling trucks that made him a fortune primarily because his trucks could travel with a heavy overload and not be stopped and fined by highway weight inspectors. These trucks helped him ruin the highways, and then his road building firm, with lucrative state contracts, repaired the damage wrought. It was the kind of operation that would warm any man's heart. Business of itself creating more business. Mario Puzo, The Godfather, 1969. The extension of federal regulation to trucking appears to have posed no very difficult problems. By 1935, the industry was sizable and growing in spite of the Great Depression. Unregulated, there was fierce competition among trucking firms. Competition claimed to be threatening the stability of the industry. At least a few railroads were beginning to feel the threat of truck competition. An important matter was the availability of a model in an existing organization, railroads and the Interstate Commerce Commission. The depression grew and truckers and the railroads sensed a crisis of competition. With little debate and the agreement of all concerned, regulation was enacted. Protocols previously developed for the railroads were applied. The ICC granted antitrust exemption, rate bureaus were created, the freight classes used by railroads were adopted, shippers paid about 110% of rail carload rate for truckload shipments and about 115% in less than carload, less than truckload situations. The situation stabilized. Unlike the railroads, which were no longer growing, the truckers wished to be protected from new entries. The commission applied a good part of its resources to actions relative to operating rights. A firm could only expand through the purchase of valuable operating rights. The creation of such monopoly values hardly seems to have been in the national interest. It is one thing to create a federal activity. It's another to change an activity. Deregulation of trucking appears to have been an extreme case on the simple side. It was difficult to develop a case for a national role for regulation of trucking. For the truck business is hardly a natural monopoly, nor do the fortunes of a few firms have national impacts. In addition, there was the recent model of rail deregulation, which occurred in 1980. Efficiency gains from trucking deregulation are said to save shippers about $25 billion per year, about 10% of the truck freight bill. Several old line unionized LTL, less than truckload, carriers had difficulty adjusting to the deregulated environment and went out of business. The adjustment period seems to have passed quickly. Yet, the desire of the trucking industry for a trucking agency in the U.S. DOT is an example of a desire to have an advocate with influence and power, even when regulation is slight. This modest change in structure promoting an existing group resulted when the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration was created in 1999, taking responsibility out of the Federal Highway Administration. Here, the dysfunction was that other modes were represented in the department, but trucking wasn't. The American Trucking Association heralded the agency as a major victory for highway safety. 22.6.2 Idea Bifurcation Nothing seems more certain than that many special highways will be constructed for motor trucking, roads and streets, December 1928. Per distance traveled, large trucks are three times more likely to be involved in fatalities than autos. Trucks take twice as long or more to stop as autos. They congest urban traffic. Truck stability on freeway off-ramps at posted speeds is a well-documented safety problem. Operators strive to achieve the benefits from operation of longer combination vehicles, LCVs. We are unable to make the investment in road facilities needed by trucks. The auto truck highway system was birthed and grew as a multi-purpose network. The truck versus auto problem is the result. If the system had the adaptive capability of bifurcation, splitting into specialized networks, those and others would be non-problems. Conventional actions focus mainly on improved truck brakes and stability when braking, and are achieving modest improvements. If we really wanted to manage that problem, the action to take would be to change the system structure, separate autos and trucks. Major actions have multiple effects. This same action would offer opportunities for reduced costs, some roads tailored to large, heavier vehicles, other roads limited to cars and light trucks only. Results might be more efficient road provision and efficiencies in equipment and operations areas. Trucks for rural use began to become available in the 1910s and 1920s, ranging upward in size from the Model T Ford with a simple truck bed in the back. At first, these were substituted for wagons for existing farm-to-market and urban pickup and delivery services. 
Although trucks moved materials by road from the Midwest to East Coast ports during World War I, as late as the 1920s, the wisdom was that only small amounts of intercity freight traffic would ever move by truck. Rail had a firm hold on that market, with air transport having long-term potential for high-priority shipments. However, by the mid to late 1930s, the development of intercity freight movement by trucks was well underway, well enough underway that the Interstate Commerce Commission regulation began. The development of the state primary highway system played a major role in the growth of intercity truck services, as did improvements in truck equipment and skills developed by trucking firms. The intercity business grew at first in market niches, movement of household goods, agricultural livestock, and automobiles in particular. Other services and the emergence of the common carrier, private, and owner-operator segments of trucking activities were in place prior to World War II, and they grew very rapidly afterward. Questions of the interrelations of equipment and roads emerged as trucks' axle weights began to be controlled to protect pavements. By the mid-1910s, cities had begun to control weights, their problem at first being solid tire coal hauling and construction vehicles. By that time, the rural road problem was regarded as tamed by the Federal Office of Public Roads. However, movement of trucks during World War I broke up roads badly, and a search was started for appropriate rural road designs. The Bates, Illinois, and Pittsburgh, California road tests provided information for pavement designs. Long-standing bridge structure knowledge was available. This knowledge, together with information on truck dynamics, was used in the design of state primary and secondary systems and later in the interstate. Interstate design also drew on the findings of the American Association of State Highway Officials road test undertaken in the late 1950s. Compared to the primary system, the interstate was designed with wider lanes, a minimum of 3.6 meters or 12 feet, lower grades, 3% maximum rather than 5, and higher overpass heights, all affecting equipment size. A design velocity of 112 kilometers per hour or 70 miles per hour was incorporated in the interstate. There are design exceptions on parts of the interstate. For example, some grades are greater than 3% and many primary and secondary routes have upgraded to interstate or near interstate standards. Although the federal government working with ASHO developed construction standards for the interstate, and also standards for maximum truck size and weight. The latter remained a state matter in many cases, for existing state regulations were grandfathered with it when interstate regulations were set. Another way to put the matter is this. Federal weight and size regulations said that the states must allow trucks meeting those standards on the interstate, but the states could allow larger and heavier trucks. The 1956 Interstate Act limited width to 2.48 meters, 98 inches, single axle loads to 8,200 kilograms, 18,000 pounds, tandems to 14,500 kilograms, 32,000 pounds, and gross vehicle weight, GVW, to 33,300 kilograms, 73,280 pounds. In general, the states west of the Mississippi River allowed higher gross and axle weights than those east of the Mississippi, and the north-south band of states, Illinois and southward, had lower axle weight standards than others. Responding to the trucking industry's desires, the Federal State Transportation Assistance Act of 1982, the STAA, co-opted state control of size and weight on the interstate on reasonable access routes. It raised the maximum axle weight on the interstate, although where states had higher weight limits, these continued. It increased width of equipment from 2.48 meters to 2.59 meters, 98 to 102 inches. It permitted single trailer lengths of 14.6 meters, 48 feet, and double 8.7 meter or 28.5 foot trailers. However, there continues to be pressure for increases in size and weights by the truck community, citing productivity and energy efficiency gains from uniform standards. The trucking industry also points to the contribution of truck taxes to financing the road system. The US DOT and the Federal Highway Administration find the pressure for increased size and weight a political hot potato. The trucking industry reports productivity increases of up to 30% from increased size and weight. Actions needed to obtain those productivity increases involve providing appropriate access routes to the interstate and sites for terminals. So far as we know, there has been no planning supporting systematic approaches to these actions and to the coordination of increased truck weights, stronger pavements, and user charges. There should be because of great efficiency gains. There are also many market niche opportunities. The 1982 STAA asked for a study of the costs and benefits of a nationwide truck route system for longer combination vehicles, LCVs, double 48s or triple 28s with the vehicles in mind. These LCVs would run about 33 meters, 110 feet in length. Because of the number of axles, they might run 55,000 kilograms, 120,000 pounds, 
well above the 36,000 kilogram, 80,000 pound usual gross weight limit. There was much interest in the trucking community because a 50% gain in productivity was suggested compared to the pre-1982 STAA situation. Mayo, 1986, provided a rather full but inconclusive analysis of the LCVs question. It laid out what could be said about safety, fuel savings, productivity, geographic availability of services, and costs. The study examined the curving and tracking behaviors of vehicles using examples of LCVs in some western states. The cost data address mainly the geometries of interchanges and staging facilities. Costs range from about $0.3 to $0.6 billion as a one-time investment, about 1 80th of annual highway expenditures. While the Federal Highway Administration study was aimed at concluding no way, it turned out inconclusive because so many signals said, good idea. We think there is a major opportunity here, and that well-conceived planning would define it. There's nothing new about the idea. Henry Ford was quoted in the Washington Post in the 1930s as supporting a regional system of truck highways, and the topic was debated in Congress at that time. While some circa 1900 designs for roads separated autos, trucks, and wagons, and bicycles, and discussion continued in the 1920s and 1930s of the needs for truck-only highways and auto-only parkways, nothing has materialized. Might those old ideas be interesting ideas today? Samuel et al. 2002 called for such a network. Frank Turner, former head of the Bureau of Public Roads, has also endorsed the idea. We think the opportunity will remain vague and ill-defined until some sort of tactical planning provides concrete ideas. The STAA standardized and increased the size and weights of truck vehicles allowed on the interstate system, and deregulation legislation in 1980 changed the situation in ICC-regulated trucking. The 1991 Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, ICE-T, recognized and went beyond the interstate by authorizing a more comprehensive national highway system. The stated intent was to focus federal funds on roads that are most important for interstate travel and the national defense. These roads also serve as intermodal connectors and are regarded as essential to interstate commerce. There is no question but that the NHS advantages trucks. The national highway system consists of the interstate many primary highways, of which trucks already make intensive use. However, the opportunity to concentrate resources by creating stronger pavements and bridges, and in turn allowing heavier or larger truck vehicles, seems not to have been seized. 22.6.3 Idea Truck Collector Service But Waz and Garrison 1994 explored designs and market niches building from today's roads and trucks. The market niche examined was the haulage of grain from farms to local, country elevators, and from local to large elevators. Optimizing equipment size and weight, road characteristics, and operating protocols, it was found that large trucks operating at low speeds on unsurfaced roads offered considerable efficiencies. The figure shows the truck design. This was a conservative approach in the sense that it built from existing ways of doing things, equipment technology, the road system and its protocols, and the ways that grain is moved. The decisions to be made if such haulage were to emerge and the distribution of costs and benefits were considered and other types of designs and market niches were imagined by the researchers. Twenty two point seven Discussion Freelander found the interstate a good investment because it saved time overall. She noted that urban efficiencies offset the higher cost of time saving by rural travelers. Yet we suggest that it ignores all of the externalities and effects of the urban freeway. Simply considering time forgets the human cost of those displaced and replaced as the urban freeway restructured the urban activity system. Still, a time calculus is very handy for transportation analysts because often faster is better and the time value of capital and labor is considered when designing facilities, buying equipment, and such. Prior to the interstate, road improvement calculations ran on the savings and equipment cost, usually just wear and tear. The United Nations and pavement engineers still use such calculations, ignoring the effects of their designs on users' time. Facility maintenance cost was also considered, but even without traffic, pavements experience wear due to weather. The consideration of time for users is critical in understanding the reason we have transportation. As the expression goes, he who wastes my time wastes my life. To argue against transportation improvements because they induce more demand is to argue against transportation projects because they do what transportation projects are supposed to do, connect people with their destinations. It would be instructive to compare the lives cost by the additional pollution generated when a new project is constructed and compare it with the lifetimes lost stuck in traffic or the opportunities lost stuck at home. Let's review the overall situation and inquire about prospects. 
The rapid growth of cities beginning in the late 1800s accelerated the provision of urban roads and cities built institutions and took actions appropriate to their needs. They created public works agencies, imposts on property owners paid for the construction and maintenance of local streets, and with experience, ways were found to fund and build parkways, viaducts, and arterial streets, and to broaden funding bases using property taxes on vehicles and tolls on costly facilities. Design and planning concepts emerged. Every grand city needed a Robert Moses-like grand plan. Planning was strengthened as the states passed legislation enabling city planning and zoning for the control of land uses. Although there was much progress, there were nagging problems. Street and railroad conflicts, state highways that dumped traffic on city streets, congestion and graft and corruption in street programs, suburbs enabled by streetcar services were quickly becoming automobile suburbs, and there were hints of the suburbanization of employment. Running faster just to keep up with the increasing use of automobiles was the response of street construction and traffic control programs. But their progress stumbled when the Great Depression of the 1930s reduced funding from property taxes. Urban growth resurged in the 1940s and 1950s, and by and large the cities had ambitions, institutions, and plans, but little money. But there was hope because state and national political stages were changing as the balance of political power gradually shifted from rural to urban areas. There was lag. The population of urban areas exceeded the rural population in the United States by the 1920s. By 1950, political support for federal and state expenditures in cities was in sight and almost in hand for highways and many other programs. The picture just painted was context for snapshots presented in this chapter. The Bragdon Committee reports, the freeway revolt, the building of limited mileage high-capacity state federal facilities in cities, the actions of Robert Moses and his imitators, and almost one half century later, the status of the urban road system. The heavy hand of the experience is there. Have we learned from it? One might say that we have learned to balance local, state, and federal interests and to pay more attention to the social and environmental impacts of large programs. That's a matter of style and equity. It is important, but how well balance and compromise are achieved is at debate. One thing is certain. Project and program approvals require resources of time and money. Obtaining action requires a trail of studies and plans a posture of local, state, and federal cooperation and funding, and providing funding to compensate for negative impacts. Burdened by what's mine is mine and what's yours is open to debate negotiations. Obtaining approvals is costly, and one wonders if high transaction costs constrain the search for innovations. Imperatives for congestion relief, improved public health, the city beautiful, and large rural-like parks affected city building in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and imperatives continue to drive programs defense, congestion, and employment, in public works construction and equipment manufacturing, energized creation of the interstate and its urban extensions. Today, emphases are on constraining urban sprawl and the automobile. The cynic might say that we have learned that programs require claiming imperatives for action. Coupled with high transaction costs, imperatives have given us mega projects such as Boston's Big Dig and the Alameda Corridor. The to tame the automobile imperative constrains funding, leading to an underinvestment in roads. Of smaller size are projects and investments in non-road-based transportation projects, transit, in response to congestion and environmental imperatives. Congestion and funding imperatives drive interest in tolls, and congestion drives interest in advanced traffic control systems. The paragraphs above strive to say where we are, using the language of programs and events. Speaking in a more general fashion, the authors see the spinning out of the maturing of the auto and truck highway system in urban settings. The system institutional and technological aspects are rather fixed, and strident claims of imperatives are needed to nudge its evolutionary path. With maturity, productivity growth comes hard, and there is market channeling as efforts are made to fit the system to market niches. Will market channeling uncover new formats that renew urban transportation services? Might the building blocks of abandoned railroad routes and yards, congested highways, heavily subsidized transit services, pre-automobile walking streets and other relics from urban transportation history merge with modern sensing and communications technologies and create new futures?